Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me today with my guest. For the second time, I have a pleasure to interact with Mr. Jan Oberg, uh, who is a great, great commentator and also uh, a photographer. And I've mentioned this before um, at our live stream, but today I decided to connect with Jan because actually Jan emphasize on this topic as well and i think we will start with the title of our live stream which is how we can avoid the war in europe and stand for peace welcome back to my channel jan thank you so much for finding time thank you of our course yeah, of course of course so let's start with this question it's a very serious question considering the current situation, especially in Europe. Um, I will have a few more questions, of course, than, more than just this one. But let's start with this. How we can avoid this, this conflict, Jan? What do you think? Well, of course, this is a big, <laughs> a big piece of cake. <laughs> uh, because everybody's talking about war now. And I refuse, one, to uh, think that everything is lost and there will be a war. There's always alternatives to war. And secondly, um, I think, and I may be wrong, that there is a deliberate um, motivation among decision makers or elites or ministers or state leaders to make us fear. Um, there's a term for that. It's called fearology. And that is when deliberately you try to instill fear in people so that they become more manageable, stop criticizing and uh, accept that, oh, the world is dangerous. We must leave it in everything to the responsibility of our leaders. Um, <clears throat> so we have to look through this a little bit and not, not buy it. But I'm not saying that this is not difficult. I've been in this business for 50 years. Uh, by business, I mean as a student and on what's in sociology and peace studies and a professor around the world and a commentator and author and all that. And I have never seen anything like the situation we're in. So I'm not underestimating. I'm just saying don't buy it all because it has secondary purposes, too. Now, if you ask me how we can avoid this, it's very simple. Uh, it's terrible to say it. It's very simple. It is a declaration from NATO headquarters in Brussels uh, tonight or tomorrow morning that we have decided to avoid taking more risks, that we will not um, encourage or promote or force Ukraine into NATO, but we will stay committed with the Russians, with Ukraine and with NATO members to find the best possible solution for Ukraine's future security, something like guarantees from all sides, non-aggression pacts, uh, you know, that can, the modalities can be discussed. But all that it takes is this. And I say this because people, and I may have said that last time we talked, people still cannot do the most banal thing in these cases, and that is to distinguish between the war and the underlying conflict. This is a very important distinction promoted over 60 years by my mentor, who just died a couple of weeks ago, Professor Johan Galtum, 93 years old, the leader of peace research studies in Scandinavia and around the world. He always said, don't look only at the war, because the violence and the war does not contain the key to a solution. It's only when, as a doctor, we understand where the pain come from, comes from, and that is the underlying conflict, that we can do something to achieve, to move towards peace. You cannot create peace by pumping in more weapons. You cannot create peace by winning a war. You can only create peace by changing what caused the conflict and what caused the conflict to blow up in violence. So... This is a NATO-Russia conflict that has been going on for 30 years. And it is that conflict you can stop by saying, we will care for Ukraine. We will not leave it, but we will also not make it our tool 
a brutal tool for fighting Russia, because that's what NATO has done now. When they found out that it was a bad idea, I think they're not more stupid that they can see it was a bad idea and everybody serious warned them. They said, now we're then using Ukraine, pumping in weapons there, pumping in CIA, pumping in uh, personnel also, as we've just heard uh, recently, to use Ukraine to weaken Russia. Now, that type of thing is not only deeply immoral and against international law, as much against international law as the invasion, Russian invasion in Ukraine, but it also makes it impossible to find a solution. And that's why they turned down the Pope. That's why they turned down everybody who doesn't say what they want to hear, namely that war is the solution. War will decide the whole thing. War will lead to peace. This is intellectual bullshit. And we have, some of us have got to say it who are not paid by anyone. Okay, so let me ask you this. Since I am not an expert in politics, this is just <laughs> coming from a regular citizen who is observing the current events. That's why you asked. I would questions. say, <laughs> I thank you. I would say at this point, when when I look at uh, the engagement of NATO in this. And as they flip flop with, we don't agree, we agree, more troops, no more troops, put it aside. Personally, I don't believe they are going to back off and they are not going to pursue this project that they have. So for me, I would like to know your opinion on this. The only way to avoid that war is if people are called to the war and they don't show up literally like this because without the people who participate as soldiers how they can continue this project Jan? so what do you think about this what i just said because i don't see any other way at this point well i agree with you of course this is an old gandhian uh, strategy uh, don't turn up there can be no wars if only the presidents or the nato secretary general should fight these uh, wars or conflicts uh, with themselves and with each other by their fists there would be no war i agree with you uh, that's why i think that that it's very important to boycott this but we also know that a lot of young people um uh, particularly of course those who have been in countries which have been attacked, uh, that is a great moral discussion. Actually, we just published a very interesting dialogue on our homepage, uh, transnational.live, where one of our associates uh, dialogue with a skeptic, uh, Mike and Sorensen, uh, dialogue with a skeptic about can you fight the Russians in Ukraine without weapons and with mass mobilization of nonviolent techniques? Now, that sounds unrealistic. I personally believe, and that's why we have published it, that this is more realistic than continuing a war. And at least you can say it will not cost as many people as it would their lives or harm as many people, and it will not destroy the country. I'm a staunch believer in, I've always been, uh, that peace in, in the principle of the United Nations too, and that's a Gandhian principle, Peace shall be established by peaceful means. That's Article 1 in the UN Charter. There's nothing to discuss. This is Article 1 in the UN Charter. And the preamble says that the scourge of war shall be lifted from succeeding or coming generations. So long story short is, you're right. This is the ideal. But try to make somebody think those thoughts today where it's impossible for people who argue for peace negotiations, mediation, UN troops, talking with each other, are totally marginalized in the mainstream media. I know it from myself. I, I could give you a long list of cases where somebody in a mainstream media in the Western world calls me and say, yeah, we know you're critical to NATO, blah, blah, blah. Um, can we make an interview with you? And I say, yes. I say yes to everybody who treats me well, East and West, North and South, like you and they don't come back they don't come back because they've gone up to the leader uh, at the editorial board and they said oh this man with those views critical of nato he's written a long story about 30 arguments for abolishing nato i mean we can't have him on board 
So they take somebody from the defense ministry or somebody from the defense academy or from the uh, intelligence service of their country, and they call them experts. Uh, what they don't see is that these are not experts in any sense of the word. They're not independent. They're part of the, of the game. If you interview somebody with a military green uniform on, he will also or she will also have a uniform, an intellectual uniform inside. And of course, if there's lots of money coming their way because military um, expenditures are increasing, it's obvious that they are part of the game. I mean, journalists don't even see this today. So, I mean, long story short, we do not have to think only in terms of classical nonviolence and resistance. We could also simply argue that we need to talk with each other at some point. I have a hard time to believe that the present leaders of the West, NATO, are so ruthless, so anti-intellectual, and so immoral that because they made a Himalayan mistake of trying to get Ukraine into NATO, that's something everybody who knew from Kissinger and onwards, including me, warned against years ago. And also when the coup d'etat happened in 2014 and the eight years of mass killing Russians, etc. If, if, if they would be what I said, to cover up that Himalayan mistake by starting what could lead to the Third World War and the total destruction, at least, of Europe in, in a conventional war. I refuse to believe that these people are at that moral level. At some point, somebody will say, when we close to a war, well, somebody will say, let's stop for a moment and think. Because if we take the next step we are now contemplating, if we can't keep on saying we are not listening to anybody, if we keep on saying the only solution is to win over Russia, if we keep on doing this, they should say to themselves, we will end up having a huge war. Maybe not a nuclear war, that I don't know. But the long story short is, I refuse to believe that people in the White House, people in NATO, people in the Nordic countries, members of NATO, are at that intellectual and moral level that in order to, to cover up for their own mistake, they are willing to kill millions of people in a large European war. I do not think so about these people. I may think many bad things about them and their military thinking and their intellectual level, but I don't think that they would push Europe and 400 million people into warfare to cover up their own mistake. I don't think so. There will be some moral politicians somewhere, or there will be millions of people marching the streets of Europe and say, kill us first before you kill Russians and Ukrainian people. I think it will happen. We'll see some extraordinary initiatives in the future to avoid this. Actually, I think, Jan, and I respect your opinion, I think that's exactly what they are doing right now. Um, they are that crazy and they are that incompetent and they are so obsessed with this. And as I see, the only two ways to prevent this from full scale war are two things. First, in my opinion, is people don't show up and someone put in the comments here in the live stream, oh, you don't know about the kidnappings in Ukraine. Trust me, I do. I see many videos of those, but they cannot kidnap everyone and there will be not enough kidnappers for those to kidnap. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. let's be honest here. Yeah. We will outnumber anyone who wants to kidnap us. Let's just break it down. Second thing, how they are going to produce all this military equipment they are already behind it. They can sign all those deals and all of those uh, agreements, but you have to have the industry created in a way that it produces the ammunition, the weapons. I'm not an expert in military subjects. I invite <laughs> the experts on my channel, but just using the logic, how they can catch up, how they can follow through with all this vision. So, I think the more people are aware where the countries are really standing, that can prevent that war from coming. Well, I think into that you can, 
sorry, I think you can technically produce the needed weapons and ammunition in a relatively short period. However, it's mind-blowing to see that because of what has been done to export everything to Ukraine, uh, the Western countries, the NATO countries, have very low uh, levels of ammunition left in their own stores and have given away a lot of, of what we would otherwise have thought were important weapon systems for their own defense. I used jokingly to say maybe this is a time where Putin should actually invade NATO, you know, <laughs> because it has never been so weak because it has depleted it itself. Now, had I said as a peace researcher some years ago, I think we have far too much weaponry. We could give it away or scrap it. We could disarm. People would say, oh, no, 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 we need every little F-16 for our national defense. Now suddenly we can give everything to Ukraine. You know, that, that's the first thing. It doesn't make sense. Point two, I think I would rather formulate it in terms of a dilemma. The dilemma that will occur if you keep on uh, converting the uh, civilian economy of Europe into a weapons or military uh, industry. There will come a time when the balance between civilian needs and military needs will offend the citizens who will say, why are we paying this price for something we're, that is not important to us? I mean, excuse me, Ukraine is completely unimportant to the Western world. It has never been strategically important. It's not important for anybody in, let's say, Sweden or Denmark. We have sympathy for it, yes, or for the people who are suffering, but the country is such yeah. is somebody nobody knows about. So let me give you an example. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Even Japan. Even Japan, by the way. Even the what? Japan. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. No, no. That, I, said, I said knowledge about it. Love of that country, etc., has been zero. It's not been an important country to anyone in the West, and it's been set before by Western strategists. That is not worth a war. Now, let me give you an example. This morning, uh, the 13th of March, the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Frederiksen, gave a press conference with her foreign minister, her defense minister, saying, I would say for God knows which time, Denmark is going to arm further. We're going to expand the, uh, so, uh, the, the conscription. Uh, we need much more women in the conscription. We will uh, surpass the 2% gross national product uh, of GNP goal, which, by the way, is intellectual nonsense. We will keep on for the next 10 years to supply weapons and civilian aid to Ukraine. She's binding the country way beyond the time horizon of her own leadership. And the two interesting things. One is, she says, we don't do all this because we want war. We do all this because we want peace. We want to avoid a war. Now, that's a little bit of a Freudian slip because she must be aware that what she contributes to, not her alone, but NATO as such, is increasing the risk of war. But you can always say we're doing it because we want to reduce the risk of war. That is the wrong way of doing it. It's like drinking more if you're an alcoholic. Point two, <clears throat> she said all this new extra armament will have a price. You know, that's what big leaders say. I know that it will have a price, but we have to sacrifice a typical war rhetoric. And she says that means no tax reductions, some social reforms that we will not be able to do. Um, you could translate into not so good schools and hospitals as we could have created without this armament. And she also has a sentence in which she says something like, we've spent a lot of money for many years on things like climate change. But we cannot continue to do both. And now the military, the military, the fight, the struggle against Russia is more important. Now, she can say that today. She can say it tomorrow. She can say it next week. But when this begins to translate into lowering uh, living standards, lower pensions, higher and higher prices, cars that can't drive, trucks that can go through Europe because of the price increase, 
and people cannot buy the most necessary things, you know, then comes the real price. And that's a price that I think none of these politicians have been thinking through because they don't think long term. They do panic decision, one panic decision after the, the other panic decision, and they get further and further away from the good goal. And it ends up being a conflict with their own society and self-destructive for the West. And that is what pains me most, that what the West does in the name of fighting and winning will lead to our defeat in the global world, because the rest of the world doesn't waste money like that to that extent on these types of things. And mind you, weapons is a waste from an economic point of view. It does give you some uh, investment and, and income and profits in the military industries, but it doesn't have a good effect or a positive effect on civil society. It is not true that the more we militarize our economies, the better we will do in terms of welfare. There is not one study in the world that says that. What it says is, if you and I have $100 to invest, and we do that in the military industry, we'll create very little employment and therefore very little consumption. If instead we use spent the, the $100 on hospital, schools, culture, infrastructure, we will see a booming effect of that $100. Now, any idiot who studied these things know this, and ends anyhow, what they are saying is we've got to do it knowing, or there must have a sense at least, that this is going to have terrible cat catastrophic effects over the years on the civilian economy and people's living standards and satisfaction with the so-called welfare states we used to have. That's self-destruction. Yeah. And they will not win the war against Russia because Russia knows better how to fight and have an experience in that than we have in the West. So the long story short is it's totally self-destructive. Yeah, and let me ask you this. On March 7th, just a few days ago, Sweden has joined NATO. Uh, mm -hmm. A year before, on the 4th of April, Finland has joined NATO. I want to ask you this. Why? Well, not really why. Wrong. How? Both of those countries were able not to be part of NATO for such a long time. How was it possible? Because why they are now, I think we all understand here. But how was it possible that they were not part of NATO for that long? Because they had an independent thinking. In the 80s, when I was the head of Lund University Peace Research Department, I and my colleagues constantly made studies for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, were paid for it came up to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they had read everything, read lines in the manuscript, saying, what do you mean by that concept? What do you mean by that? How does that relate to this? There was an intellectual attitude. There was a country called Sweden that had its own policies, who dared to stand up against the US and Vietnam. A prime minister who chaired a commission called the uh, Common Security Commission, Olof Palme, which were coined, which developed the most intelligent, the most helpful concept, namely, common security meaning security i am secure when i know that you also feel secure i'm not secure when i know you feel insecure common security is the only security that is real security now so how was that possible because we didn't have lazy people we had people who were deeply engaged people who had a vision people who said neutrality demands something special it depends on independent thinking and independent policy. And I'm not saying everything was good in Sweden. Sweden was already at that time, for instance, one of the world's largest arms exporters measured by per capita. But still, it was small countries in solidarity with other small countries. And the Nordic area were proud to be a low tension area. And those two countries that were NATO members, Denmark and Norway, had um conditionalities to it for instance no foreign troops on our territory no foreign uh, weapons uh, stored etc now they are going to have 40 bases in the nordic countries um, agreed behind the back of the people with no public discussion but with uh, early negotiations with the united states of america now the americans must think that they are all fools over here because we just do like this and then we get what we want 40 bases in a few months so it was perfectly possible if you had an active, if you put priority into it, if you have an active foreign policy and were determined to not go the way of the block system, but 
believed in the vision that it's terribly important that there's somebody who are neutral between the blocks because that kind of keep the blocks a little bit away from each other. There's something you have to pass through and there's some time to react because you cannot just cross these countries. Now we've done like this. One party is here, one party is there and there's no time to react. If a, if a crisis happens, there's no time to react. And this is damn dangerous. But that is not what the Swedish people and the Finnish people have been told. They've just been told that our security is there. Would you believe it? The Swedish Prime Minister, Mr. Christensen, now has a standard formulation saying after 200 years, we have finally come home. After 200 years as a neutral state, we have finally come home. And then he adds to the countries of freedom and democracy and human rights. Now, excuse me, I've lived in this country the last 50 years. I didn't know that Sweden was not home. It was the proudest thing of the Swedish people that they thought differently, that they hated nuclear weapons. And in the 50s, thanks to the then Social Democratic and the Party and their women, Inga Torsan and others, decided that Sweden would not have anything to do with nuclear weapons and would not have its own nuclear weapons. On the third day of his prime ministership, Mr. Christensen went down and gave a press conference to at NATO with Mr. Stoltenberg next to him. And he said, Sweden will live up to all its obligations in NATO, including NATO's nuclear doctrine. You can only get away with saying that because you've not had a democratic debate and because you ignore people's mandate, because you are not serious about democracy. It is very, very sad, but that is a fact. There were 47% of the Swedish people in favor of membership when the application was sent. That is far too little for such an important decision to be made. And you don't get out of it. There's nobody who's left NATO and been allowed to leave NATO. And then you solidified with 17 military, um, bilateral agreement about 17 bases, US bases in Sweden, which cannot be changed for 10 years, cannot be abrogated no matter what happens. And in these huge areas where they'll be sitting at 70 places in Sweden, it's under American jurisdiction, not Swedish jurisdiction. We've sold the country. We saw parts of the sovereignty, both decision-making and physically and legally. Now, don't tell me that that could be done through uh, lively public discussions. The Swedes are not idiots, but they have been the object of fearology. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming to the Gotland Islands. The Russians are soon coming and taking southern Sweden, where I speak to you from now. That's when you can make people believe anything. And therefore, I'm working on this idea of a public debate, public education, and people to begin to say democracy is about us. And we do not want a government that is more loyal with Washington and Brussels than with the Swedish people. So this looks to me again like the same formula. They put people that they choose or groom through generations into certain positions that are prepared to be there in the governments. Mm. Um, some of those who are not groomed are blackmailed. Well, most of them are blackmailed, but especially those who are new and they enter the cool and the gang circle, as I say. And then you have the media that supports that because you have to repeat the same story in order for a percentage of population to fuel fuel those uh, who are oh, yeah. yeah. So now the military industrial me me media the military industrial media academic complex yeah. movement, the media is part of it. If we had a free press, it could not be part of it, but the media are part of the military industrial media academic complex. And those are the elites who behind the backs of everybody without any, I mean, Eisenhower warned against it. The president Eisenhower warned against it in his farewell speech in the uh, early sixties, that there is a, a, a kind of group that runs foreign policy and are driven by profit motives. 
And it is a threat. We must rein it in and control it. Now, nobody has controlled that since the 60s. And that's what is now taking its hold on Sweden too. A few elites in the military, the industry, the media, the academia, research institutes, etc., who build a complex of their own interests. And they couldn't care less about the rest of the people. They just tell the people, you'll be much more sure, sure and safe and, and secure no, no matter what we do. Even the nuclear weapons in Sweden, for instance, you'll be more secure. And who among the people can actually, unless they are really making themselves experts and have study circles and know more, who can really argue against such a massive influence? This is not a few people. This is a massive one from left to right and in the military, industry, media and academia. It's the same all over the place. I can say different things because my academia, my institution is totally free. Not part of anything, not, not part of the government, not part of, 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 of the corporation. Don't re as a principle, don't receive money by anyone who is involved in military affairs. But how many are left of such people? <laughs> yeah, and I want to ask you here this, uh, because this happened very recently on 7th of March when Sweden joined NATO. I'm not mm. asking now about how the country that you live in, Sweden, responded to that event. I will ask you, if you turn off the media, all of that, if you go on the street or you're in the shops, and do you hear any conversations, not from your friend group, but from other people, let's say, maybe you overhear some conversations, how people were reacting to it? Did you hear anything? Well, the things I hear and people write to me uh, is of two types. One is, I don't like Putin, but I don't understand how Putin would come to Sweden and be a threat to us. And the second thing is, well, when it comes to the media, the primetime news and televisions, I don't believe it anymore. I was out with my car mechanic this morning. And we talk politics because they know I'm interested in politics and they're very sweet people. And they are. So what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And they say, well, that sounds reasonable. And also, I don't believe what the Swedish media are telling me. I mean, that would not have happened five years ago, or 10 years ago. Then people have said, but Jan, you must be crazy. That's not what I, what I hear in the media. But now people say, I don't trust the media. I don't trust what I read. And I'm, I'm, I feel at a loss because I don't know where to go to get reliable information. That, that is a response I get very much from, from people I meet on my way who are not, let's say, friends or colleagues or family. I, I, this is not scientific. You asked me for my impressions mm -hmm. and that's what mm -hmm. you got. I mm -hmm. can't tell you whether Thank you. how much of Thank you. You, you, you see, I think the Western world is heading for what I call the Pravda moment. Pravda was the truth in Russia, the, the leading newspaper in the old Cold War days in the Soviet Union. And at some point, the people found out that what was in the truth newspaper Pravda was not the truth anymore. I think that will happen also for people who believe in primetime Swedish, Danish television and BBC or CNN. They'll find out that this all choreographed at some point. I'm not saying they're all lying, but I'm just saying they don't get half of the truth and they never get the counter arguments anymore. We did that earlier, but not today. Thank you, Jan. Pravda in Polish and Russian both. Um, I think maybe even in Czech as well means the same truth. Mm -hmm. We also say Pravda in Polish. But, you know, you actually answered the question that is the title of this video. When you answer, I didn't think about it. Now I realize there is another way besides the aspect of not showing up. More and more people even if they don't understand Putin or they don't believe in Putin, they don't agree with Putin. That's one aspect. What is more important even in this is they don't believe that Russia wants to attack any other country and they don't believe in mainstream media. So with those two things, I think that already is a huge, huge uh, hope for many, yes. many people. Yes. I started out saying that I think there is hope, <laughs> but not if the elites get their way. But I don't think that people are stupid enough to just uh, sit and wait for uh, a big war to happen without doing anything. At some point, they'll be convinced that they have been fooled. 
So we will end this live stream here, everyone. This will be a little bit shorter today. I hope everyone is okay with this. Yeah, and the best way to find you, I already attached the website of yours down below this live stream. Um, any other websites or links you want me to mention or you would like to say to the audience? No, I just think that that's fine. Um, the links to other places where people can read uh, TFF Associates and my own stuff uh, are mentioned in that transnational.live. And uh, I, I'm not saying that, uh, that probably what I should end by saying is, I think that those of us who work for peace, nonviolence, the UN goal or criteria of peace by peaceful means, peace shall be established by peaceful means. We have a right to not be excluded. And that's what we have been. I'm not saying we have the truth. I'm not saying that we know everything. But I'm saying some of us knows a little bit more than most of the decision makers do. And I used to say to people, and I mean it, if you study security and international affairs in study circles intensely and read five or 10 books, discuss them in your little group or your peace movement or whatever movement or political party, you will know more than the average decision maker. Decision makers get their way because they have this stage to be at. I'm the minister of this, I'm the prime minister of that, and I come out and I drive a limousine and I'm important and what I say is worth gold and things like that. You know, I'm not impressed. I think that everybody can become their own experts and better experts than most of those who run the world today. And one place to go is our website, but there are hundreds or thousands of others to also go to. I'm just asking for democracy, free expression and free media. It should be possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, for joining me today. Thank you, everyone, for watching thank us. Uh, thank you for your likes, your comments, and until next time, lots of love, everyone.